Hello and welcome to the Beach House 34 podcast. I'm your host, Christine Worth. A big and warm welcome to all of our new subscribers. I am so glad that you're here. And to our amazing listeners, thank you so much for your continued support and encouragement. It is so appreciated. You have no idea. Before we get started, this episode is a continuing series on the trial readings for the Darley Routier case. This is a mother who, in 1996, was accused and convicted of murdering her two children in Rowlett, Texas, and who currently sits on death row. As soon as these trial readings are finished, I will be back to doing weekly true crime and paranormal cases. So, in the last episode of the Darley trial, we heard from Luann Black and Karen Neal. Now, Luann is Darley's aunt, and Karen Neal was the neighbor and friend of Darley's and whose house that Darren ran to the night of the crime. It was definitely some very interesting testimony. And if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to that, I highly, highly encourage it. Today, we start off with a new defense witness. And this witness will actually, it's quite long, this testimony. So this is going to go over a series of episodes. But the witness is Detective Jimmy Patterson, who was the lead detective in the case. So with all of that said, let's get started with Detective Patterson's testimony. The direct examination is being done by one of Darley's defense attorneys, Mr. Douglas Mulder. Would you tell the jury your name, please, sir? And then Mr. Mulder says, excuse me, judge, are you ready to go? And the court says, well, let's see. We always think we are, but we don't know. I'm not sure this sound system is working here. All right, I think we have that taken care of now. And then Mr. Mulder continues. Would you tell the jury your name, please, sir? Jimmy Ray Patterson. Mr. Patterson, you are a police officer? Yes, sir. And you work for Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir, I do. And what was your position via v the Darley Routier case? I am the lead detective in the case. All right. Well, you left town before we had a chance to talk to you. When did you leave Kerrville? Sometime after 6 o'clock, Thursday afternoon. Thursday afternoon. When did you first come to Kerrville, Mr. Patterson? The first time I came down here was on the 6th. The 6th of January? Yes, sir. Okay. And you were with us until sometime after 6 o'clock on Thursday of last week. Is that correct? That's correct. Have you brought your notes with you? Yes, sir, I have. Do you have your case file with you? Yes, sir. Could I see it, please? I don't have it right here with me. Where is it? It's in the back. Could you get it, please? Yes. Let me hand you what has been marked for identification and record purposes as Defendant's Exhibit Number 72, and I'll ask you if that is the notebook that you just handed to me. Yes, sir, it is. And this contains your entire file on Darley Routier. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You and I have never met, have we? No, sir, we have not. We have never visited about this case, have we? No, sir. Now, when were you first notified that there had, in fact, been a, an assault or a death there at 5801 Eagle Drive in Rowlett? June the 6th, 1996, at about 2.55 in the morning. Okay. Were you at home or were you on duty? I was at home. Okay. And as a result of that... Did you have occasion to get up and get dressed and proceed to that scene? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. About what time did you arrive there? About 3.30, 3.35. Okay. And who was there when you arrived, Detective Patterson? There was some fire personnel there. There was some uniformed officers at the scene. The lieutenant over CID was at the scene. Who is the lieutenant over CID? His name is Grant Jack. All right. Was he down here for the past three weeks as well, along with you? 
No, sir. Has he been here? Yes, sir. Okay. He is back in Rowlett now, I guess. No, sir. Where is he? He is here now. Oh, he came back down with you? Not with me. He came back down. Who else came down this weekend? An officer, Dwayne Bedingfield, Sergeant David Neighbors, and another detective by the name of Chris Frosch. Just the five of y'all? Yes, sir. Okay. When did y'all get back down here? I got back down here yesterday about four o'clock. Okay. When did the others come? Do you know? I'm not sure. Okay. At any rate, you got out there and the medical personnel were there. Is that right? I don't know. No, I think they had already left and I talked to a firefighter. Okay. Do you know how many medical personnel had been there? Not total? No, sir. Okay. I take it you interviewed the paramedics who had been at the scene? They had written a written statement. I mean, does that mean you interviewed them? I did not talk to them personally. No. Did you talk to any of them? No, sir. All right. And you don't know how, whether there were eight or nine or ten, or you don't know how many there were? I don't recall how many were out there. Okay. What was the first thing you did when you got to the scene? The first thing I did when I arrived at the scene is I met with the officer in charge. And who was that? Sergeant Matt Walling. Okay. And I guess you talked with Sergeant Walling? Yes, sir. Okay. And what is the next thing that you did? He briefed me on what he knew at that time. And I just walked up to the front door and there was an officer Wade at the front door. He asked me if I was going inside, and I said no, and I just veered inside for a second. You did go inside, did you? No, I did not. I just looked inside from the door from the front porch. I thought you said you veered inside. You peered inside? Yes, sir. I just looked inside. You just looked inside? Yes, sir. And what was the next thing you did? Well, Sergeant Walling had told me about a screen that had been, we're not going into what you were told. I asked simply what you did. I walked around to the back and noticed the screen window had been cut. Okay. And when you went around to the back, did you have occasion to look at the back gate? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you notice anything unusual about the back gate? It was open. Anything else? No, sir, not at that time. Did you move it back and forth to see how it swung in place? No, sir, I did not. Did you see any scuff marks at the base of the gate? I didn't look. Okay. Will you tell the jury which way the gate swung? Inwards. Okay. Inwards to your right as you were going in from the garage or to your left? As you walk up to the gate, it swung open this way and he demonstrates. Okay, and it was open at the time you first observed it? Yes, sir. Okay, and you walked around to the screen that was cut? I walked inside just enough where I could see the screen. I didn't go up to the screen? Well, why is that? Well, I didn't want to tamper with any evidence in case there was any. Okay, did you know that other officers had already been on the scene and had been to the screen? Well, the only thing I knew was that there had been an officer look in the backyard. Just over the fence was your understanding? No, just went inside the backyard to look to make sure there wasn't any suspects. Okay, but had not actually approached the screen. Was that your understanding? I really didn't get into that to know. So you didn't know? whether anybody had gone in the backyard or what the extent of the backyard was. I didn't know who had been in the backyard. Okay. I just knew that a couple of officers had went in there just to make sure that there wasn't a suspect. Okay. After that, what did you do? At that point, I went back around to the front and asked by my lieutenant to go to the hospital and meet with the witnesses. Okay. Did you talk with anyone else at the scene before you went to the hospital? Well, I had talked to one of the fire person or the paramedics just for a brief moment. Yes. Okay. Did you talk with any of the neighbors? 
Yes, sir. You forgot about that? No, I didn't forget about it. Okay. I asked you if you had talked to anybody else before you left for the hospital, didn't I? Right. And I just said that I had talked to the captain. Well, you were fixing to tell us about the neighbors? Yes, sir. Okay. As a matter of fact, you were advised that there had been a small black car at the scene, had you not? Mr. Greg Davis says, I'm going to object to that as hearsay. What he was advised, the court says, I'll sustain the objection. Mr. Mulder continues, well, when you talked to the neighbor, was your attention directed to this part of the street? Mr. Greg Davis says, objection, that is hearsay. The court says, overruled, go ahead. Mr. Mulder says, yes, sir. The witness says, I heard a lady call out that she wanted to talk to an officer. Mr. Mulder continues, okay. And I walked over there to talk to her, okay. And were you advised that she had seen a small black car in this location? Yes. Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'm going to object, Your Honor. That is hearsay. The court says, sustained. Let's phrase our questions properly. Mr. Mulder then continues, okay. Was your attention directed to a location immediately in front of her mailbox? Mr. Davis again says, I'm going to object. That is hearsay what he was advised or directed. That has to come from someone else who is not here. So it has to be hearsay. And Mr. Mulder says, well, judge, he can testify to that. The court says, just a minute. I'll overrule that. Let's go ahead and move on with the case. Mr. Mulder says, sure, and then continues. Detective Patterson, moving right along, will you tell the jury whether or not your attention was directed to this mailbox in the parking area immediately in front of it? Well, not to the mailbox, okay. To the parking area immediately in front? Tell the jury where your attention was directed. We'll make it easy. Okay, a lady had called out and asked me. She said that she wanted to talk to an officer, and so I walked over there. You talked to her, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you made a note in your supplemental report, didn't you? Yes, I made a note. Yes, sir. Okay. And in that note, you said that there had been, Mr. Davis says, I'm going to object to that. Mr. Mulder says, a black car that night. Mr. Greg Davis says, judge, please, I'm going to object to this. Mr. Mulder says, judge, let me finish my question. The court says, let him finish his objection, please. Mr. Davis says, I'm going to object to that as being hearsay and referring to documents not in evidence. And the court says, all right, well, let's, all right, well, I'll sustain that objection and let's phrase our questions properly, please. If you want to put the document in evidence, then let's do so. I assume you are referring to Defendant's Exhibit Number 75. Mr. Mulder says, Judge, that was Defendant's Exhibit Number 72. The court says, I mean, defendant's exhibit number 72. Mr. Mulder says, Judge, I'm not suggesting that I put his entire report in. I don't mind giving him his report to refresh his memory. The court says, well, I think if you will just phrase the questions properly, then we will move on. Let's go ahead, please. Mr. Mulder continues, all right, well, all right. Again, as a result of your conversation with the lady, where was your attention directed in this enlarged, what would you call that area? A residential area. Well, yes. The court says, you might speak a little bit louder because the last two jurors have to hear you down there. Just speak into that mic so they can hear you. And Mr. Mulder then continues. What would you call this area? Is this a little parking area? Yes, sir. I would call it a street. Okay. And would you call this a parking area in the street or not? Well, no, sir, I wouldn't. What would you call it? I would call it a street. Okay. But people parked along the curbside. Yes. Okay. This appears to be a car headed in. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And do people park in that fashion? Yes, sir. Okay. And will you tell us and tell the jury what your conversation with the lady was about, please, sir? She asked to speak with an officer, and so I walked over there, and she said something to the effect that she had saw a car. The court then says, the jurors cannot hear you on the end down there. The witness then says that she had saw a car leaving that scene. 
as the police and the fire department had arrived or right after they had arrived. Mr. Mulder asks, and she also told you that she was familiar with the cars in the neighborhood, didn't she? No, sir, I don't recall her telling me that. Okay, you made a note of that in your report, did you, the, your conversation with the lady? Yes, sir. Did you later on that afternoon have an occasion to, you or one of the police officers there, to talk with a Karen Neal in regards to a small black car that had passed through the neighborhood that afternoon? I did not. Do you know if anybody else did? No, sir, I do not. Would it be your responsibility as the primary officer in charge of this case to find those things out? I mean, would you be the center where the information is funneled into? Yes, sir. Okay. And I take it that this report over here, Defendant's Exhibit Number 72, is an accumulation of reports that other people have filled out and submitted to you? That's correct. So you would, for lack of a better word, be the central information clearinghouse, I guess, in this case, for lack of a better description? I could, yes, sir. Okay. You would be the one who ought to be familiar with whatever is going on in this particular case, right? Well, you have to understand that, you know, I'm not going to remember everything and that, you know, I did look over the reports. Okay. I mean, that is the reason we make reports, isn't it? Because we can't be expected to remember everything. Well, that is to refresh our memory. Yes, sir. And like you have so skillfully pointed out, had it not been for the paramedics' reports, you wouldn't know what any of the paramedics did out there, would you? That's correct. Because you have not, to this date, talked to any of them, have you? No, I have not. Okay. So you don't know which ones were in the house, whether they were all in the house, or what parts of the house they went into, or what they did while they were there, do you? Well, by their notes, I do know. Oh. They all addressed that as to where they went in the particular house and what they did. They addressed what they did, yes, okay. But they don't address where they went in the house, do they? No, sir, I don't believe so. All right. And you didn't think that that was important to you, I guess, in evaluating the case, or you would have interviewed them? They have been interviewed, but not by you, but not by me. Okay, did you interview the officers that were first on the scene? I read their notes. Okay, so your knowledge of what their activities were, of course, would be limited by the notes that they prepared? Yes, sir. Okay, and if a witness or a participant in the investigation of this case did not prepare a report, of course, there would be nothing for you to review, would there? Does that make sense? Well, I don't understand what you are saying. All right, well, if a participant in the investigation made no report, either because he was directed by the district attorney or someone else not to prepare a report, there would be, of course, nothing for you to review, would there? Well, I don't think anyone is going to tell someone not to prepare a report. Well, that would be mighty poor police work, wouldn't it, in your judgment? Maybe in some cases, yes, okay. You don't really want to commit to that one? Well, no, I do not, because I really don't understand what you are asking me. Well, I'm saying this as simply as I can, that it would be very poor police work not to prepare a report, would it not? Well, that depends on what you are doing and what, you know, and what you did in this case. Well, okay, if you didn't want anybody to find out about it, it would be a great idea, I guess. Well, we are not going to do that. We write our notes and we make supplements to these reports. Okay. Did you make a supplement to your report when you all met down at the courthouse and everyone took the witness stand and testified as regards to what they did in this particular case? Did I take notes? Yeah. Did you make notes on that? No, sir. Okay. Why was that? I didn't see any need in taking notes. Okay. And I take it you testified in that event? No, sir. But you were there and listened to everyone else? I was there and we talked about our case. Yes. Okay. 
Was there someone on the bench in lieu of the judge? Well, there was someone sitting up there in the judge's chair. Okay, well, just by coincidence, or do you... Well, I don't know why. You never did figure out why? No, sir. All right. Well, let's just see if we can't figure out why. You know what circumstantial evidence is, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay. Was there someone in the prosecutor's at the prosecutor's desk in the courtroom? Yes, sir. And was there someone at the defense table? A lawyer? Yes, sir. And was there someone up on the bench in the judge's position? Yes, sir. And was there someone on the witness stand where you are right now? Yes, sir. And did the prosecutor ask them questions? Yes, sir. And did the defense lawyers ask them questions? Yes, sir. Now, circumstantially, do you think that we could put those circumstances together and figure out that they were conducting a mock trial? I think what we were doing is that we were just trying to make sure. Well, we wanted to make sure that the prosecutors knew what we knew. Okay. And it helped, I guess, to make sure that the other officers knew everything that you... Well, I don't know about that. You don't know about that. Okay. Now, at any rate, after you had talked to the lady at the curbside there in what you termed to be the street, and I would call an enlarged maybe elbow of the street, did you then leave to go to Baylor Hospital? No, sir. What did you do? There was another lady that came up and I talked to her for a few minutes. Okay. And who might that have been? Her name was Barbara Jovell. Okay. And did you engage her in a conversation as regards to a black car? She had mentioned that her mother had seen a black car. Okay. When in time had her mother seen a black car? The way she described it, it was earlier on the 5th. Just the day before? Yes, sir. And in fact, less than eight hours earlier. Would that be about right? No, sir. I don't know about what time, but it was more than eight hours earlier. Okay, nine hours, ten hours, I don't know. When did she tell you that? When I talked to Barbara Jovell, which was sometime between 3.35 and 4 o'clock, we tried to contact her mother, but her mother, I could not understand what she was saying. Okay, did you understand that being a detective out there, I guess you would want to know where she saw the car, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. And what the car was doing? She didn't know what the car was doing, all right? But you would want to know what she thought the car was doing that was suspicious, right? Yes, sir. I mean, it had to have been doing something that, I mean, there are a lot of cars out there. Can we agree on that? Well, there's a lot of cars that drive out there, yes. Okay, and most of them, we aren't going to think anything about them because they don't do anything to attract our attention, right? Right. So this had to be one that attracted her attention, right? Well, she told us about it. Yes, sir. Okay. And where did she tell you that car was? My understanding was it was in the alleyway behind the house. Okay. Is this the alleyway behind the house? Yes, sir, it is. This is the alleyway behind the house? Right. That's correct. All right. And you understood. It was in the alleyway behind the house and apparently doing something that was, or at least she thought it was suspicious. Is that right? Well, the only thing she could say is that it was a car behind the house and going through the alleyway. Well, of course, a car behind the house going through the alleyway ordinarily wouldn't be suspicious, would it? No, it would not be. All right. So there must have been more to it than that to have attracted her attention and to have her she never did tell me. She wouldn't tell you? She didn't tell me. All right, well, after that, did you then leave for the hospital without talking to anyone further? Yes, sir. Okay, and where did you go, Detective Patterson, when you arrived at the hospital? To the emergency room. Okay, and who did you see there? I first met up with a uniformed officer who had directed me to where Detective Frosch was. All right. And did you find where Detective Frosch was? Yes, sir. All right. And about what time did you arrive at Baylor Hospital? About 4.30 a.m. Okay. And did you determine 
that Darley Routier had already arrived there? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you determine what time she had arrived there? No, sir, I did not. Okay. Did you determine that her youngest son, Damon Routier, had arrived at Baylor Hospital? Yes, sir. Did you determine what time he had arrived? No, sir, I did not. Did you determine at what time either one of them left the Eagle Drive address? No, sir. It didn't seem to be important? I'm not saying it didn't seem to be important. I didn't ask. Okay, did you ask later on? No, sir. So it never has seemed important? No, I'm not saying it didn't seem important. It just wasn't a question that I asked. Well, I mean, you have not asked to this moment, have you? Well, no, sir. So apparently it's not important to you even now. Well, it's on the fire department's run sheet. Did you look at it there? I reviewed the run sheet, but I don't know what time they left. Okay. Well, would you tell the jury what time they arrived at Baylor Hospital? I just told you I don't know. All right. Well, at any rate, did you proceed to where Detective Frosch was? Yes, sir. And where was he? He was in a waiting room where Darren Routier was. Okay, all right. And just the two of them? No, there was another person there. I believe his name is Terry Neal. Okay. He is Detective Frosch's cousin by marriage, is he not? I don't know what he is to Detective Frosch. Okay. You have never talked with Detective Frosch about that? He made mention that he was some relative, but I don't know what. Okay. At any rate, did you interview Darren Routier at that time? Yes, sir. And how long did you and Detective Frosch, in the presence of Detective Frosch's relative, talk with Darren Routier? We didn't. You didn't talk with him? I didn't talk to Darren Routier in front of Mr. Neal. No. Well, why is that? Well, we had asked Mr. Neal to step out of the room. Okay. So both you and Detective Frosch were there. Is that right? In the waiting room with Darren? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And you interviewed him at that time. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And I assume that you took notes of that interview? Yes, sir. Okay. And where are, are your notes in this? No, sir. Where are your notes? Back there in the office. Could you get those notes for us, please, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Would you, the notes are not part of your file, is that right? No, they are not. Okay. Would you just, whatever you have, would you bring them on out here and I'll save you a trip? Yes, sir, I will bring them all. Okay, thank you, Detective Patterson. All right. In your presence, I'll mark this for identification and record purposes as Defendant's Exhibit Number 73. And that is a number of stapled notebook sheets, is that correct? Yes, sir. And this contains all of the notes that you have made in this particular case? Yes, sir. When were these notes made, Detective Patterson? They have been made at different times. Okay. I figured that out, that they were made at different times, but... Did you date them? Some of them is dated and some of them are not. Well, why wouldn't you date all of the reports? Well, I just didn't date them. Well, why? I don't have a reason. I just didn't date them. Well, you knew what the date was, didn't you? I know what the date is going to be. All right. But how many did you date and how many did you not date? Well, there's a few pages that are dated and a few pages that are not dated, okay? Now, let me hand you back what has been marked for identification and record purposes as Defendant's Exhibit Number 73, and will you tell the jury which of the pages of your personal notes are dated? Page number one has a date. What is the date on page number one? June the 6th, 1996. And that relates to your conversation with a Nelda Watts? Yes, sir, it does. All right. And it has the time? Yes, sir. What time? 3.45 a.m. All right. And I assume that you put down everything that was relevant in that conversation that you had with her? Yes, sir. Okay. And then the next one is Barbara Jovell? Yes, sir. All right. And what time is that? June the 6th, 1996 at 3.54 a.m. Okay. 
And what is the next page that is dated? June the 6th, 1996. Okay. And does that have someone's name on it or relate to a conversation? Yes, sir, it does. And who might that be, please, sir? Teresa Marie Powers. Okay. Teresa? Teresa. Teresa Powers? Yes, sir. And what is the date and time of that? June 6th, 1996 at 4.36 a.m. And who is the Teresa Powers? A nurse at Baylor Hospital. All right. So by that time, we can assume that you are at Baylor Hospital. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you find any other notes in there that are dated? Excuse me. I think there is a medical, it says M.E. office, and it has the date, but nothing written. It has the date on there. Is that what I am holding up here? Yes, sir. Where it just says 544 a.m. and 6696 M.E. office? Right. Does that mean you were at the M.E. office? No, sir. What does it mean? That means that that is what time that I talked to someone at the ME's office from the hospital. Can you tell who you talked to? I don't remember her name, but you can remember that it was a female? Yes, sir. But didn't write any notes other than that? No, sir, I didn't. Okay. So other than that sheet, the only other notes that are dated and timed are this second sheet you said and this first sheet. Is that right? Can I finish looking at that? You bet. And there's some date on these last, the date and time are on these last three pages. Are you talking about a report that you did? Yes, sir. That was a supplemental report, right? Okay. Did you take, I guess the way we got into this, and I have not asked for them, but you said you took notes about your conversation with Darren Routier? Actually, well, yes, there is notes in there. Yes, sir. Okay. Could you point me to that part, please, sir? Okay. Are you referring to a supplemental report? Yes, sir. You didn't have a laptop computer or a typewriter with you? Not with me, no. Okay. But I thought you said you took notes. I did. Where are the notes? That is this right here. Well, that is typed. Okay, I didn't take handwritten notes. Oh, you took mental notes. You mean we have been going through this exercise and you have been telling me all along that the notes you took were simply mental notes? Yes, sir. Okay. And those, I guess, were those timed and dated? My mental notes? Mm-hmm. Well, I have dates and times on there. Okay. But the notes that you took, that you were telling us about when you interviewed Darren Routier, were mental notes? Correct. Okay, all right. Now, how long did you talk to Darren Routier? 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. And had he been interviewed by Chris Frosch prior to the time that you got there? Yes, sir. And do you know how extensive he had been interviewed? No, sir. Okay, you didn't talk to Detective Frosch and find out? I talked to him briefly, yes. Before or after you interviewed Darren? Before, okay. Where did you talk to him? In the presence of Darren? No, just right outside the waiting room. Of course, you didn't make any written notes on that, did you? I did not, no. All right. Now, you proceeded from there to where? after you had interviewed Darren Routier. Then I went back and went into the room where Damon Routier was. About what time was this, Detective Patterson? Sometime just before 6 a.m. Okay. So about what, if you arrived out at the hospital, at what time? About 4.30. Okay. And you talked to Darren for half an hour or so? Yes, sir. Would it now be 5 o'clock or thereabouts? or a little after. Where did you go from your interview with Darren Routier? I went to the room where Damon Routier was. Okay. And did you view his body? Yes, sir. And how long did that take? I can't give you a time. I was in there a few minutes before I notified the crime scene officer. Okay. And where did you go from there? From where? From the room where Darren... 
demon Routier was? Well, he was in a room that is there attached to the emergency room, and I just went outside and made a phone call. Okay. And who did you call? I called the dispatch, Rowlett Police Dispatch, and asked for a crime scene unit. Okay. And who did you talk with? I do not remember. Okay. Where did you go from there? You were outside, and you were on the phone. You finished your phone conversation. Where did you go next? Back in there and talked to Frosh for a little bit. By this time, what time is it? I don't know. After 5 o'clock? Well, it's after 5, yes. It's just shortly before 6. Okay, so you talked with Frosh. Now, during your interview with Darren Routier, did Detective Frosh take any notes? Yes, sir. And in your presence? Yes, sir. Written notes? Written notes? I can't say for sure. I don't know. Okay, all right. And I mean, is there some reason that you all didn't take written notes? No, sir. I mean, I guess I wouldn't know enough not to take notes. Is that a bad practice to take notes? I don't think so, no. But you just take them sometimes and sometimes you don't? Well, in this case, I didn't take any notes. No. Okay, so at any rate, after you have conferred with Detective Frosch, where did you next go? I waited on a crime scene unit and he arrived, at which point we went back into where Damon was and we took photographs, okay, of Damon's injuries. Okay, you said we did. Are you saying that someone else did it in your presence? Right. Do you remember who did it? Yes, that was Officer Dwayne Bedingfield. All right. And what happened after that? At which time the family arrived, they wanted to see Damon, and we let Miss Darley Key go in there for just a moment, and then she left. Okay. And then what did you do? We found out that we could go talk to Darley Routier. Okay. And had you left instructions with Darren not to leave the room that he was in? Or was he free to leave? Or what were your instructions to him? Well, I don't recall telling him that he couldn't leave. Okay. So as far as you were concerned, he was free to leave? Yes, sir. You didn't tell him anything to the contrary? No, sir. Not that I recall. Well, that is something you would recall, isn't it? Well, I don't remember telling him he couldn't leave. No. How about Detective Frosch? I don't know. Not to your knowledge? I mean, he didn't tell him he couldn't leave to your knowledge, did he? I don't know if he did or not. Okay. At any rate, who told you that you could see Darley Routier? I believe it was an officer by the name of Phyllis Jackson. Okay. Was she a young lady who worked there at Baylor Hospital? As a policeman? Yes, sir. Part of the Baylor Private Police Personnel? Yes, sir. Okay. And about what time was it when you went up to see Darley Routier? About 6.11. Okay. And who was present when you interviewed her? Detective Frosch and a nurse by the name of Chris, and I can't recall his last name. But a male? Yes, sir. Okay, just the three of you? You, Frosch, the nurse, and Darley Routier? That is all that was in there that I saw. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? You would have seen them? Well, we were behind, somewhat behind a curtain. I couldn't see the front door or the door leading into the hallway. All right. Do you know whether or not Darley Routier had been medicated? I do not know. She was there in the hospital, correct? Correct. She had injuries that you reviewed? Yes, sir. Did you, were you advised that she had just come out of surgery? Yes, sir. Okay. And again, as a detective, wouldn't you put two and two together and figure that she had, in fact, been medicated? Well, I don't know. You didn't know? No. And I take it that you didn't make any inquiry as to whether or not she had been medicated? No. And you didn't think that that might be important when you interviewed her? What I did was I asked her if she was okay and felt well enough to talk to us, and she said she did. Okay. She was cooperative, wasn't she? Yes, sir. And, as a matter of fact, answered all of your questions didn't she? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you take notes of that conversation? No, sir. Okay. 
Detective Frosch took the notes. And you know, of course, that he took them and recorded them accurately? Yes, sir. Okay. Even though you didn't take any notes yourself? No, because I told Frosch that I was going to ask the questions while he took the notes. Okay. And you were not under any time restraints, were you? No, sir. Okay. So you could have talked to her, I guess, as long as she was willing to talk to you? Yes, sir. And she was willing to talk to you as long as you asked her questions. She would answer, wouldn't she? She answered our questions. Yes, sir. How long did you talk to her, Detective Patterson? 20 or 30 minutes. Okay. Did you tell Detective Frosch to note, in his notes there, the date and time that the interview began and the date and time when the interview ceased? I did not. Okay. Do you know whether he did or not? I know that he... He has the date that we was there and the date that we started or that we went up there and the time that we went up there. As far as him jotting down the time we actually started the interview, no. He didn't do that? No. And he didn't jot down the time that you stopped. Stopped the interview? No. And I guess you didn't think that was important or you would have had him do it? Right. I don't see that that had anything to do with it. No. But at any rate, that conversation lasted some 20 or 30 minutes. Something like that. Yes, sir. And she was cooperative the entire time. Yes, sir. Did you ask her what had happened or what she recalled? Yes, sir. And what did she tell you? She told us at that time that an intruder had, well, she had awoken to find an intruder over her. She struggled with the intruder. She saw him with the knife. I asked her to describe this person, at which time she started to describe the person, and I asked her to stop for a minute, and let's start from the very top to what he was wearing. Okay, what did she tell you? She said that he was wearing a black cap, and I said, was the bill to the front of the face, or was it turned around backwards? And she said the bill was to the front. Okay. I asked her if she remembered seeing any writing on it. She didn't see any writing or no pictures. I asked her if she knew whether it was a fitted cap or if it was one that you had to adjust. She did not know. I asked her from the cap if she could describe his hair, and she said it was a dark-colored brown that it was shoulder length. It appeared to be straight. I asked her to describe his face and she could not describe any part of the face. I asked her to describe what he was wearing, and she said he was wearing a black t-shirt. And I asked her if it was a black pullover t-shirt, a buttoned-up t-shirt, and she said it was a pullover, that it didn't have any buttons on it, it didn't have a collar on it, and it was short-sleeved. All right. I asked her if it had any writing or designs on it, and she didn't see any. I asked her about a belt. She couldn't remember if there was a belt or not. I asked her about his jeans, the blue jeans. I asked her if she could remember if they were blue, blue jeans or a different color. She said blue. She couldn't remember any labels on the jeans. Okay. I asked her about his shoes and socks, and she didn't remember any shoes or socks. I asked her, because of it being a short-sleeved t-shirt, if she saw any tattoos or scars on his arms, and she said no, that she didn't remember any scars or tattoos. Of course, naturally, we think about robbery, and I asked her about her jewelry, and she said the jewelry, she described her jewelry real well and where it was located, and I would have to look at my notes to see what else she said. Okay, are you talking about your written notes? No, I'm talking about Frosch's notes or the supplement. You just made mental notes? Yes, sir. All right. Have you had occasion to review Frosch's notes? Yes, sir. Before your testimony? Yes, sir. Yesterday, I suspect? Yes, sir. Okay. When is the last time before yesterday that you reviewed them? The last time I reviewed Frosch's notes had been right after he gave them to me months ago. All right. Let me hand you what has been marked for identification and record purposes as Defendant's Exhibit 72, and you will have his notes in here? Yes, sir. 
Would you find those for me, please, sir? I mean, 72. Okay. And what happened is at this point, the judge lets the jury leave the room while Detective Patterson goes and gets his notes or his files, whatever it is that he grabbed. The jury comes back in and everything is resumed back on the record. And Mr. Mulder says, Detective Patterson, while the jury was out of the room, you went through your entire file here, did you not? Yeah, pretty much so. All right. And were you unable to find Chris Frosch's notes there? I didn't find them. No. It's your file, isn't it? Yes, sir. All right. You are telling us that Chris Frosch's notes are not in your file? I didn't see them in there. Okay. But you reviewed them last night? I did. But I didn't look in that file. I've got a copy of his notes. Where is that? I just gave you two pages. Oh, you are talking about what is written up here? The supplement. Yes, I just gave you two pages of the supplement. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, well, I was talking about his actual notes. I don't have that. Are you talking about handwritten notes? Yes, sir. I don't have those. Okay. So what you are telling us, you reviewed, you apparently reviewed the report that he made and not his handwritten notes. What I reviewed was he has a supplement and I reviewed his supplement. Okay. Let me hand you what has been marked for identification and record purposes as defendants exhibits 74 and 75. And I'll ask you if you recognize Chris Frosch's handwriting. I'm not sure. Well, I don't know whether you would take my word for it or not, but he handed those to me and told me those were his notes. Okay. Do you have any quarrel with that? No, sir. These are the notes that you saw him taking in the hospital? No, sir. Oh, these are not the notes that he was taking at the hospital? I didn't see what he was taking because where I was standing, I was asking questions and he was kind of standing to my left, and I wasn't really paying any attention to him. Well, when you left the hospital, did you review his notes to make sure that he put down what was accurate? No, I did not. Why not? Well, I just didn't review his notes. Well, I mean, you wanted to be accurate with what she said, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I mean, what better way to be accurate than either, one, record it with a tape recorder, and you could have done that, couldn't you? We could have, but that is not a policy that we use. No. Okay, well, I don't care whether it's your policy or not. I just want to know, well, we care that it's our policy, and it's not our policy, so we don't use a tape recorder. Did you have that option? You could have recorded it with a tape recorder? Well, we don't do that. But you could have? We don't do that. Well, the court says, all right, let's move on. I think everybody understands the question and the answer. Mr. Mulder then continues. Well, you could have video recorded it if you had chosen to, but we don't do that. Well, you video record drunk drivers, don't you? That is uniform. That is separate than our division. All right, so you have the equipment available to you? We have video equipment, yes, sir. You chose not to do that? No. You chose not to take any notes yourself, and you chose not to review your partner's notes. Would you look at those notes now? Defendants exhibit number 74. Would this be the first time that you have looked at them? The first time I have looked at this, yes. All right. The first time that you have ever seen his notes, as regards the conversation that took place at approximately 6 o'clock on June the 6th of 1996. Is that right? Do what now? This is the first time that you have reviewed Chris Frosch's notes with respect to the conversation between you and Darley at 6.11 or 6.15 or whatever time it was. I reviewed his notes. I reviewed his supplement. Well, are those the notes that you reviewed? No, I reviewed the typed supplement that he... All right, I understand. Would you review his notes, please, sir? Sure. Okay. 
The court then says, all right, you may continue, please. And Mr. Mulder says, yes, sir, and then continues. Do you feel like you are well enough acquainted with those notes now to answer some questions? Yes, sir. Okay. You had told the jury or given them an account. And is it fair to say that these notes probably start on this page that I have marked Defendant's Exhibit Number 74, where it says Baylor Hospital, Baylor Medical Center, Dallas, in recovery room approximately 611? Do you see that? Would that be fair to say that that is probably where those notes start? Well, no. It looks to me like it started on the first page. Well, but if you will read that, that appears to be an interview with Darren, isn't it? On the first several pages? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. These are Detective Frosch's notes, and that is probably who you are going to have to ask about that. Okay. Well, inasmuch as you have refreshed your memory from his notes, you have told us about, for example, you gave us a description, and that description was based on what Detective Frosch wrote down, I assume. Was it not? The description of what? The description of the assailant that Darley Routier described to you during the morning of June the 6th? And what I can remember, yes, sir. Okay. Did she tell y'all that the man was possibly black? She did not tell us that morning. No. She had told the uniformed officer. Wonder why he wrote it in his notes up there. Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'm going to object to that. That is improper impeachment. The court says, sustained, sustained. Let's move on. If you want to call Detective Farash, then call him. Mr. Mulder says, Judge, I intend to call him. Well, then fine. Let's move on to what this witness actually knows of his own knowledge. And the witness then says, that is not what that says. Mr. Mulder says, yes, sir. Mr. Mulder then says, black cap. Mr. Greg Davis says, I'm going to object again to him going into that document. And the court says, sustained. Mr. Mulder continues, did he have a black cap on? She says he had a black cap on. Okay, shoulder length hair or collar length hair? What I remember is, it was about shoulder length, excuse me, collar length. Did she ever describe the assailant as possibly black? I had one of the other supplements from Officer Waddell showed black or white. Okay, black or white, is that right? Black or white. Now, you were telling us about talking to a lady about an unusual car out there, yes sir, and talking to this Barbara Jovell about a car and talking to another lady about a car that was parked in that what you call a street, is that right? Yes sir, all right. Were there any other people that reported a small black car in or around the Routier home that evening or early morning, either the evening of June the 5th or the early morning of June the 6th? You will have to ask me that again. Okay. Why was it? Why did you care whether there had been mysterious cars or suspicious cars out there? What importance could that have possibly been? Well, at the time, we were looking for an intruder, okay? So that is what made it important if there were suspicious cars out there, is that right? Yes, okay. And did you find people who had seen suspicious cars out there? Did we find people? Yes. The lady, Miss Watts, told me about a car. That is one. But she didn't say black car to me. She just said a car. She said a dark car, to one of your other fellow detectives, didn't she? Well, I don't know if it was a dark car or, well, I would have to read that again, but it was a dark car, mid-sized, and then Miss Jovell was the one that was telling me that her mother had seen a black car in the alleyway. Okay. Well, did anybody tell you that they had seen a car around midnight drive up her alley and look in the garage and turn or toward the garage and turn around and leave and just hanging around in that area, a small black car? Well, yes, sir. That is about a three-inch account. Have you read that? Well, there is a supplement about someone telling a uniformed officer about a car, okay? It was dated on 6-8, all right? I mean, it is your report, right? 
Did you find someone who had seen a small car in the alley shortly before midnight, some two or two and a half hours before the attack? I didn't talk to anybody about that. I know, but that report came into you, didn't it? Which report? That report there shows a different date. Drove by the victim's home slowly. Drove in the alley. Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'm going to object to that. The court says, sustained, please ask the next question. Please answer all of the questions you know of your own knowledge directly and succinctly and as quickly as possible. The witness says, yes, sir. Mr. Mulder continues. Did you say that this is the first time that you have actually seen the spiral notebook with the handwritten notes? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you were there approximately 20 to 30 minutes. Is that what you have previously testified to? I was where? At the hospital, at Baylor, talking to Darley? Yes, sir. Okay. 20 or 30 minutes. Is that right? About that. That is not a trick question. I want to move on. Approximately, yes. Okay. And did you then leave the hospital or did you go back to talk to Darren? I don't remember talking to Darren anymore after that. Okay. Did you return to the hospital anymore that day? I don't recall being back at the hospital that day. Of course, you didn't put anything in your notes about it, did you? No, sir. You didn't put anything in your notes about talking to Darren, did you? Yes, sir. You did? I have a supplement showing I talked to Darren. Well, but I'm talking about your handwritten notes. I didn't take any handwritten notes. Not about when I talked to Darren. Okay. No handwritten notes when you talk to Darren. And no handwritten notes when you talked to Darley? No, on that day. Right. You don't recall returning to the hospital that day? I don't remember coming back to the hospital. Well, does that mean you could have? I could have. Okay, but you wouldn't. Of course, there is no way we will know because you don't have any notes. Is that right? I know that I talked to somebody about coming back to the hospital, but I don't remember that I went back to the hospital. All right. When you left the hospital, will you tell the jury where you went? That morning? Yes, sir. I went back to 5801 Eagle Drive. Okay. About what time did you get back there? And this is where we're going to leave off. Patterson's testimony lasts for quite some time, and we've now moved into the time frame where he has left the hospital and gone back to the house on Eagle Drive. And that is where we will pick up in the next episode. So let's recap what we've learned so far. Mr. Mulder begins by asking if the detective has his case file and his notes with him, and he said that he did. So uh, Patterson tells that he was notified about the crime at around 2.55 in the morning. He arrived on scene about 3.30 to 3.35 a.m., he said that some fire personnel and officers were at the scene and said that the medical personnel had been there, but they had left. And he had, I guess, only spoken to a firefighter. He didn't know how many medical personnel had actually been at the scene prior to him arriving. Now, he did not interview any of the medical personnel that had been there, but evidently they had left written statements. It's unknown when they had the time to actually write down these statements. Um, maybe it was after the fact. I don't know. But, you know, here I'm picturing, hey, he shows up. He didn't talk to any of any of them, excuse me, and then says, hey, but they left written statements. I mean, it's really, it's highly doubtful they sat there and wrote out a statement before they, they took care of their patients, right? And Patterson then met with the officer in charge uh, when he first got there, and that happened to be Sergeant Matt Walling. He then gets a little bit of information and walks around to the backyard and notices that the back gate is open. He kind of glances inside towards where the garage screen was, said he didn't want to walk into the backyard because he was afraid he'd mess up any potential evidence. He then went back around the front and was instructed to then go to the hospital and talk with the witnesses. He literally has to be asked if he spoke to anyone before he left. And he said that he talked to one of the firepersons or the paramedics. Now, 
I thought they had left by that point, but he might be talking about, you know, the paramedics with the fire department. I'm not sure about this. This is all that he said, though. He had to be asked if he spoke to any neighbors, and he then admitted that he had. But then Mulder, the defense attorney, kind of calls him out on this because he had to be he had to be asked about it rather than just flat out give Mulder this information. So then we find out that Patterson then he talks about a lady across the street who was calling to him to talk to him. And Mulder then begins to ask about this black car because that's what this lady evidently was telling Patterson about. Now, Greg Davis, he objects to this multiple, multiple, multiple times, but eventually Mulder is able to get his question out. He's finally able to ask Patterson what the lady that he spoke to told him. And she evidently had said that shortly after the fire department and the police had arrived, this car had left. Patterson was then asked if he spoke to Karen Neal, and he said that he had not, but then he was asked if he knew who did, and he said he didn't know but thought it would be in a report but couldn't remember. Mulder then points out that even at this date, at this point in the trial, Patterson had never ever interviewed or spoken to any of the paramedics that had been on that scene that night. Mulder then brings up the fact that if, you know, no one ever made a report, then Patterson would have nothing to review, which Mulder made seem rather convenient, right? We then learn that before he left for the hospital, meaning Patterson, he also spoke to Barbara Jovell, and you might remember her from an earlier episode. She was also there, and she wanted him to know that her mom had seen a black car the day before the crime. He spoke to Barbara between 3.35 and 4 a.m. They evidently tried to call Barbara's mom and talk with her, but Patterson, he said he couldn't understand her. But he did evidently understand that she had seen this car in the alleyway behind the house. And according to Patterson, she didn't tell him if there was more to this black car other than just going through the alleyway. And then Mulder makes an excellent point saying, well, if it's just a car driving through the alleyway, why would she consider that suspicious? Because that happens all the time. So there had to be something different about what this black car was doing. Patterson then said that he went to Baylor Hospital about 4.30 in the morning and was told where Detective Frosch was. Uh, Patterson never asked as to when Darley or either of her children had arrived at the hospital or even when they left the house. He said he never asked, but then said that it was on the fire department's run sheet. He said he looked at it, but didn't know what time they left. So when he got to the room, where Darren and Detective Frosch were, Terry Neal was there. Now, this is Karen's husband, and remember, they live across the street. And here, we learn that Frosch and Terry Neal are cousins by marriage. Now, whether this matters right now or in the future, I don't know. But I didn't know about this. I thought it was kind of interesting. He said he went into the room to interview Darren, and evidently they had Terry leave so they could interview Darren. But here's the thing. I thought that Frosch was already talking to Darren by the time Patterson got there and Terry was still in the room. So did Terry then hear the questions being asked of Darren? Because remember, Frosch and Terry Neal, they're related. So maybe he felt a little bit more comfortable with Terry in the room and say, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and ask these questions. Or, or they were just all hanging out waiting for a second officer to arrive. So there's a little couple of different ways you can look at that. So they had Terry leave the room. And we learn that Patterson then took quote unquote notes. But, and <laughs> seriously, Seriously, it, this is really laughable. He took what he called mental notes. He never wrote anything down. He later typed it up in a supplemental report, but that's it. He is then asked if Frosch took notes, and he said that he did, but he wasn't sure if he wrote them down or not. You know, <laughs> seriously, this has got to be a joke, right? 
I mean, how do you actually say, I took notes, but then to you, your notes are also mental notes as well as physical notes. I, this does not make any sense to me. We get more notes from actual notes from Detective Patterson when he's on the stand and he is asked if he has dated these notes and he said not all of them and which is true we learned though that a vast majority of his actual physical notes that he made aren't even dated at all. Patterson was evidently told by Phyllis Jackson. We also heard from her early on in the trial. Uh, she is the officer that works for Baylor, um, that they could go in and see Darley. And he's asked if he is asked if he told Darren whether or not he should stay where he was or if he was free to leave. And Patterson could not remember. Now, honestly, if he couldn't remember something that simple, what makes him think that his memory of a 20 to 30 minute conversation with Darren is going to be any better when he eventually writes his supplemental report. Patterson is then asked if he knew that Darley had just come out of surgery. And he said that he did know that, but he didn't realize that she would have been medicated. So this guy, he, he's got to be playing everyone, right? He really can't believe this, can he? I mean, I... Yeah, I, I really don't know what to say about this. Darley did agree to speak with both Patterson and Frosch. And again, no notes were taken by Patterson. However, this time, for some reason, Patterson had asked Frosch to take physical notes while he, Patterson, asked Darley questions. Now, why wasn't this done in the case of Darren? I'm just curious. I mean, if they're doing it for her, why aren't they doing it for him? Patterson is then given time to find these notes that Detective Frosch had made while Patterson was interviewing Darley, and Frosch evidently was writing these down, and he was not able to locate them in his files. He is asked if he recorded the conversation, and he said no, because it's not the policy of the police department. He said that they spoke to Darley about 20 to 30 minutes in the hospital. And ironically, this is about the same amount of time that he said he also spoke to Darren, approximately. So that's kind of where we're at right now. He's covered this. They've gone over, hey, who took the notes? How long was this conversation with Darley? And then asked, okay, well, what did you do next? And at this point, this is when he goes back to the house. And this is where we left off and where we will pick up in the next episode. But I would love to know, do you have any thoughts, opinions, ideas, suggestions, am I reading into this wrong, about the whole, hey, mental notes and physical notes kind of thing? Um, I'd just be curious as to what your thoughts are about this. So if you have any, please leave them in the YouTube comments area for this particular episode. I really do want to know what you think about this. And remember, we're not completely done with Patterson. We still have at least one more to go in this portion. We then move to two additional witnesses and then to a third witness, which is Darren. And then Jimmy Patterson is actually back on the stand, followed by Officer Chris Frosch. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Thank you all so, so much for listening. I appreciate each and every single one of you. Again, if you have any comments or thoughts or ideas, please leave those in the YouTube comment area for this particular episode. I would love to read them. We will pick up where we left off with Detective Patterson in the next episode. And we will talk very, very soon. Bye for now.